All right, hello, Fortinas, brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Ministry Revealed. It is, uh, I almost forgot what month it was. I did forget what month it was. June 19th, 2024. Man, as you guys all know, we are in exciting times. This coming Friday into Saturday will begin the true seven Sabbath count to the true Feast of Weeks. We have proven it. We have broken it down. It's an exciting time, brothers and sisters. Because the 8th of Av, that 8th to the 9th of Av, is the revealed date of the pre-trib escape of the ready, watching, diligently seeking Bride of Christ. Do we pray it's this year? Absolutely. Have we revealed and spoken and broken it all down many times over the years? Absolutely. Especially in the last year, when I say over the years, but especially because it's something we've diligently continued to seek and search and we've got the answers in scripture so with that we've got some more exciting stuff here tonight we're going to i'm going to touch on just a, a couple things one the first thing as we get going is to make a point uh as to the season and time to hear a leader say this the second thing is uh i was talking with our brother mike uh, from interrupts 165 yesterday and just got into you know just all these type of conversations you know that we have here that we might talk about in the forum and you know end with each other and um you know it's just such an exciting time to just to try to imagine that we've really understood that we really are the final generation and what it then means if you're part of the remnant bride that remains to serve the lord it's crazy just to fathom it that you won't taste of death because you will be like an enoch it's crazy it's wild to think about but I'm going to make a point because um, he had Mike had brought this up just as we were in conversation. And I, I thought it was a good thing to to remind ourselves again as well, because we've proven when the winter wheat is ready compared to when the spring wheat is ready. We know what their differences are. We've broken them down. And I want to reiterate something that we probably haven't shared in, oh, man, at least a year and a half or so since the last time that I spoke about it. And it just again proves this portion this remnant portion of the bride of christ who will remain as the lord's servants as the the luke 24 as the as the smyrna remnant group that will work to serve the lord we're going to get into that and then what we're going to do is i'm going to start the the next portion that will follow after that will be kind of like another little ending piece to the second last video i thought it was really interesting in relation to the usage of the word light it's so awesome and it connects to this group that's why i thought it was a good fit to follow um the the this adding of of this winter wheat portion that remains because it ties directly in to that next portion of the video that is about light and where we find it and what it says and who has it and who doesn't it's awesome then from there I mentioned, I believe in the last video or the second last video, that I've got some another new revelation, and it's all about Josiah. We're going to see another crystal clear typology of Josiah from Scripture in his typology of Christ. It is so awesome, and it came from a video that um, was shared in the forum. And when you guys hear me talk about the forum, you can click right here on ministryrevealed.com. When you go to ministryrevealed.com, here's the website right here. And we've got hundreds of videos on there, so it might take a second. You can come right here, click on forum. It'll take you five, tech, 10 seconds to sign up. There's about 1,200 people around the world uh, in there, and there's a number sharing of, uh, of prayer requests and Bible studies and events going on and so forth. In this video, uh, with Jonathan Kahn was in there, and it's about his new book, The Josiah Manifesto. And so I was watching some of it, and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. I was like, what? So, of course, I go right in there. I connect it and show our, our uh, revelation of the seven churches of the end of days that ties in to prove this. And what do we know about the revelation of the end of days, guys? What do we know about the seven churches? That we're in Laodicea right now, and that something happens at the very end of Laodicea to who? 
to the group of remnant workers. And you're going to see this connection with Josiah, how it, it has a connection to an end of 70, and then it's almost like it wraps all the way around again, ending with another 70. What? It's wild. It's so incredible to see. You're going to see like his mid-trib portion when he comes at the end of seals to the first part of trumpets. You're going to see where money is paid and the cutoff happens. You're going to see where the Lord's saying the wrath of God is coming. You're going to see where the again is going to happen and where it ends. The very next chapter, the end of Josiah starts with the end of 70 years again. It's so wild. I think those of you who have been around for a little while, you guys are going to love it. It's it's exciting to see and to track and to follow. So we're going to have some fun with this tonight. And for anybody that's new, as I always go into, if you're new to this ministry, you're going to hear some crazy things like the tribulation being 14 years and a portion called above, that's the 50 days. That above, right before, right as that 50 days is about to start, the pre-trib bride of Christ is taken out. When the 50 days are over, it'll be an attack on Jerusalem, the second attack, but this one on Jerusalem, and it will begin the 14 years. We show it, we break it down. We've been doing this for years now, for seven years now, as a matter of fact, because it all started on June 16th, 17th of 2017 when I first started doing videos, but the, the official date that I say when everything changed and the revelation began was on September 8th, 2017. So seven years from when I first did a video, but not quite seven years from the official revelations beginning. But um, you'll also hear things about this difference of who the Gospels are speaking to. And what we always recommend is to come to the playlist right here on YouTube and come to this video series right here. Watch the first four videos. Or you can go to Ministry Revealed again. Go to ministryrevealed.com. Click on the menu. Click on the intro and watch the same first four videos. This is the intro video. This one's about 22 minutes, and it gives you a little glimpse of what the next three videos are going to really get into and reveal for you. The second video, who the Gospels are speaking to, this is a 30-minute Bible study. It has notes if you want to download them. You can one-click download to your device for the video if you want as well and save it on your device. It goes into this the, the, the literal revelation, the meaning of these purposed differences within the Gospels. Like if you ever read Jesus going to the cross, in Luke he was arrayed in a gorgeous robe, in Mark he was arrayed in purple, in Matthew he was arrayed in scarlet. I mean, why? Why were there three different colors describing the same event? Well, when you realize what it means and why there's all of these differences within the Gospels, specifically about the same stories but spoken of differently in Matthew, Mark, and Luke in the Synoptic Gospels, it will blow your mind. And what you're going to realize is Luke is to the bride of Christ. Gorgeous white robe, right? When he, The gorgeous robe that Jesus is arrayed in means white, radiant, beautiful like a bride. Mark's is purple. Matthew's is scarlet. Both of those are tribulation colors. So you go to Revelation 17, the woman riding the beast is arrayed in purple and scarlet. You're going to see these things, and just in this 30-minute intro Bible study, you're going to begin to see and understand these differences. If you really want to go deep into that after, then after you watch the first four videos, you can come watch this one. This one is a, uh, a three-hour study of the differences in the Gospels that goes way beyond this, and it tells us the same story every time. That Matthew, Mark, and Luke are written to three different groups of people, and the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. Matthew, Mark, Luke, in the end of days goes Luke, Mark, Matthew. And what does it reveal? Pre, mid, post are all true, but I'll save that for you guys to dig into yourselves. That's why everybody can go to Scripture and support their position of pre, mid, or post. Because it's in Scripture. Well, when you realize who the Gospels are speaking to and understand these differences within the Gospels and realize that they're all prophetic, you'll see for yourself as well. The third video, 
reveals the 14 years in that portion called above. It's seven years of seals and seven years of trumpets. It doesn't mean one seal, one year, second seal, next year, third seal, next year. It's, it's not like that. They, they will mix. Some will overlap. Some will stop. Some will start. Others will, will come in and take their portion and so on and so forth. Okay? It's not one after the other after the other one year by year. And when you see this, it, it's all throughout Scripture. But then you're going to say to yourself, how is this possible? How come we've only understood seven years all of, for, for, what, two, three hundred years? We've been told seven years, seven years, seven years. Well, one, it wasn't yet the time. The Lord was meant to reveal it in the final generation, and it's happening. And we prove it. It is proven all with Scripture. And this is just a 30-minute Bible study getting into it. So you're going to say, well, why have we only understood seven years all of this time? The answer is the, th is the fourth video. This video is a two-hour and 45-minute study that will answer those questions. How were these things missed? Why did we only understand seven years? The answer is because for centuries we've all been taught from the Gospel of Matthew. And the Gospel of Matthew is only seven. The Gospel of Matthew is written to the house of Judah. The Gospel of Mark is written to the Gentiles, I mean, to, to the house of Israel with the Gentiles grafted in, which represents the world and the church that's still asleep and not ready. And Luke's speaks to the pre-trib, ready-watching portion of the church, ready to be taken out as his bride. So because Mark wasn't understood, everybody who believes in pre-trib believes everybody is going pre-trib that calls on the name of Jesus. That's all you have to do is believe Jesus and you're going. Well, that's not true. And the pre-mid post-revelation of it proves it. So the reason we've only understood seven years is because everybody's foundational understanding comes from the Gospel of Matthew, even though they never realized it. Because we've been taught. So when you understand that there's a was, is, and is to come, the was is from creation to Christ, the is is from Christ until the moment of the pre-trib, and the is to come is from the pre-trib until the end. We've all been taught and are being taught through the eyes of the is. So people study and try to understand prophecy through the eyes of the is of events that took place. And they're doing it through the perception of Matthew's gospel because they barely go to Mark and they go to Luke even less. It's like 90 something percent that people go to Matthew and they go a little bit, maybe five, six, seven, eight percent to Mark and maybe a couple percent go to Luke once in a while to find those those little pieces that were maybe missing in the story of what's being told in Matthew. But the truth of the revelation of the end of days is all of Matthew, all of Mark, all of Luke, and it goes Luke, Mark, Matthew in the end of days. So if all you've understood is going to Matthew 24, Matthew 24, Matthew 24, like a broken record, then all you've ever understood is seven years, and you've missed half the story. Your pre-trib is really the mid-trib great multitude rapture because it's as if you're at the end of Mark's gospel. You're at the end of Mark's story, and now the seven years of trumpets begin. Which means what? Which means the seven years of seals are for the world for the world and the Gentiles, right, that are grafted into the house of Israel, the church that wasn't ready, the sleeping church, they will be there during seals. And for all those that wake up during the great multitude rapture that will have woken up during the greatest revival in human history, once the pre-trib happens, because there is no great revival that's beginning now. There's little pockets maybe of revival for sure, but the Greatest revival in human history will not begin until the pre-trib happens and the tribulation begins. These are the depths of the things that you will come to understand just in this four-video intro series. And then from there, you can go into the deeper stuff, deeper into the Gospels to see the, the discourses revealed in order with Luke, Mark, and Matthew, to see pre, mid, and post all revealed in the triumphal entry, transfiguration, and resurrection stories, they all give a picture of pre, mid, and post. 
This is a, a breakdown of the tribulation from the book of Revelation. This is the mystery of the seven churches, which I might do again because we have a bunch of new revelation that we can add to the story. Nothing's changed in that revelation, but we can add to the story. Mystery of the comma and it's such a wild one. The open books is, is another level. And then, of course, it's all a fractal from all in the beginning, at the beginning of creation, Genesis 1-1, all the way to the end, including the revelation. It's a fractal of a fractal of a fractal. It's absolutely incredible. So with that, if you're new, those are the places we always recommend to begin. And if, and especially, even if you're newer, but you haven't yet gone through those four videos, I promise you, watch those four videos. Study them, pray over them, ask the Lord to open your understanding in them, and you will understand Scripture. Not just prophecy, but you will understand Scripture and it will cause you to dig into the word more and more and more than you ever have before because you will be excited to understand what's happening as you read it. All right. So, so exciting. So with that, guys, I'd like to also do a little shout out request. If you click over here as well, beside Ministry Revealed and you click on the more. You can see our shipping address. You can see we also have our PayPal link. And we have PayPal over here um, in on the website as well. You'll see it. It was on the home page. And you see it like right here. I think uh, this one right here. The reason I'm I'm putting out the request is it's been, it's been much slower than usual lately. And uh, with the time being so close, giving it a less than two months, we have left to go. We just want to keep pushing. We want to make a push not only here, but we want to make a push in uh, Uganda as well for our brother Steve. He's had some serious back pain and had to go to the hospital, painkillers and everything else. But it doesn't look like it's anything serious, but the pain is serious. But he's going to just, you know, manage his way through it because he knows there's not much time left as well. And so we want to be able to send more Bibles or for him to send him the support as well to get more Bibles, to get print out more Ministry Revealed books, more of Cindy's books, um, and, and just support all the needs there. We want to reach as many people as we can with this time that's left. So if you've ever felt you were going to, now would be a great time. If you've considered it, now would be a great time. Or if you're feeling led, please do so. And besides that, Definitely always praying for us, keeping the enemies at bay so we can continue, all of us here, not only here in the ministry here at my place uh, in Uganda, but over each other as well as, as the enemy realizes the time is short and the battles are increasing. So with that, I appreciate you. Thank you very much. God bless you all, and let's get going. All right. So this is that first video. We're just going to play, I think, maybe a minute or so maybe two minutes and I want you guys to understand this isn't just anybody right this is Serbia's president so this is a president of a country listen to what he has to say what is your impression would the Ukrainian government be willing to negotiate with uh, Russia or is there also the total confrontational mood I cannot say that it's a confrontational mood and mode. They are not in an easy situation and I do understand their position. Doesn't mean that uh, I 100% agree with them, but I do understand their position. Like I do my best to understand Russian position as well. I am afraid that we are very, very far from reaching any kind of arrangement. I spoke to President Xi as well, Chinese president, and he has the same view on this issue as I do. We are very far away from reaching and, the agreement. And how close... Not before, not before the end of the year. How close are we now to a third world war? Confrontation. I, that, I cannot say a third world war, but a big confrontation, how far we are. I believe that we are not far away from it. Not more than, not more than three, four months. You hear that? The guy, see, everybody's talking now. What about World War III? Is World War III close? Oh, my goodness. 
Yeah, it's close. And what does this guy say? Maybe not World War III, but a big confrontation? Yeah, the big confrontation that will lead to World War III? He's saying that it's believed to be about three to four months away. And this was just a recent video here in June. So what if we go one, two, three, four months away? Four months away. When is the attack on Jerusalem? On the Feast of Trumpets, 2024, would be not the first attack. That's not the beginning of tribulation. You've got the escape of the Bride of Christ. You've got the first attack, 40 days of the Son of Man, all the events. And then you've got the attack on Jerusalem. When this attack by Syria comes on Jerusalem, that begins neighbor against neighbor, nation against nation for Mark's discourse and the beginning of the red horse rider in tribulation. This is the beginning of World War III when Syria destroys Jerusalem. That's what's coming. What did he say? Three to four months? This is right exactly in the three to four months, closer to the four-month window. About three and a half to four months. It, do they know something? It sure makes you suspicious, right? But what do they know? They're watching the times. They understand what's going on. This is the leader of a country. They're aware of these things going on, right? It's tense, guys. So that's not to scare. That's just to, you know, as much as it's it's not encouraging when we're talking about the potential of World War III coming, it's encouraging because the Lord's time is at hand. When justice will come, it will come violently and appearing vicious, but it's all for the Lord's purpose. It is all for his purpose to wake his people up. All right? Now, here's the other piece I wanted to share with you guys in relation to winter wheat. We know the difference between winter wheat and spring wheat. Winter wheat is called the old wheat because it's planted in the fall. It grows through spring and summer, and it's harvested in summer. Whereas spring wheat is planted in the spring, and it's harvested in the fall. Winter wheat is the older, and spring wheat is called the younger. It's the story, as we know, of Leah and Rachel, the older before the younger. They relate to two wheat harvests. And it's the wheat harvest, as we know, that goes first. And what do we know about this wheat harvest? I believe, and we've revealed, that this is, depending where you are in the world, this is the pre-trib escape that begins right at the start when the 50 days of the above then begin, which will, attack with, which will begin with the light affliction in northern Israel. This is the time of the pre-trib, and it will be the first fruits of the Feast of Weeks of the Wheat Harvest, which is the winter wheat. Now, why is this important, and why am I showing this? We've covered it many times. We know this, but do you guys remember this? Some of you who are newer might not know this. Do you know that winter wheat can be grown as a cash crop or a cover crop? Winter wheat, not spring wheat. Not, not soy, not barley, not all these other things. The number one crop that is used as a cover crop is winter wheat. And what is cover crop for those of you who haven't heard of it before? Cover crop in agriculture, cover crops are plants that are planted to cover the soil rather than for the purpose of being harvested. Cover crops manage soil erosion, soil fertility, soil quality, water, seeds, pest, disease, biodiversity, and wildlife in an, what is it, uh, an agro ecosystem. This is called cover crop. It helps maintain the topsoil so that what? So that the crops coming after it have more nutrients in the soil. Isn't that awesome? This is what I was talking about earlier. It's directly related to the remnant worker group of the pre-trib that's remaining to work and serve the Lord. The pre-trib winter wheat is being taken, but a portion of them are being prepared, trained up, 
and will be chosen by the Lord to remain and serve him. And what are they going to do? They're going to be putting their necks on the line for the Lord. They're going to be his winter wheat cover crop. Watch this. You guys remember this? John chapter 12. John chapter 12, starting in verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again, Andrew, Philip telleth Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall to the ground and die, it dies alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hates his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. What is it, brothers and sisters? That's his cash crop. Where is it found? In John, in John chapter 12. John, where chapters to years? John chapter 12. Where is John chapter 12? In the Revelation of the chapters to years so for those of you that are new we have a revelation you saw it in the intro series on the website as i was scrolling down before the um before the fractal there's a video called the open books we revealed hosea zachariah john acts in two ways ezekiel psalms in two portions genesis hebrews exodus and judges that reveal within their chapters the events that will play out during the end of days within their years and so john chapter 12 is talking about that remnant group putting their necks on the line and having put their necks on the line will bring forth much more fruit well it equals the fifth year of seals do you know what happens when you go to the fifth year of seals or let's just say in this example remember i said it's not one year per seal one year seal one seal one seal by year they overplay and they overlap and so forth but they will play their portion in their time as well so at the fifth seal if we consider this in the fifth year of seals what would be happening in the fifth year of seals if we go to the fifth seal look what happens check out this direct connection to the conversation being had revelation 6 verse 9 and when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Funny how that happens, right? Directly in line, in line with the seal it would be connected to in the chapter related to those who would put their necks on the line who were chosen by the Lord to remain from the pre-trib, who are winter wheat as the cover crop portion. Wild, right? It's, it's so crazy when you see these things and when you follow the connections, because this proves out, as we've done many times, it proves the validity of the chapters to years, of the events coming in the end of days. Everything falls in order over and over and over and over and over again, hundreds even into the thousands of times now. So now the next section. And this one is what I was telling you guys about. It's kind of like a, a little add-on to the second last video surrounding the mustard seed. So what, what, what had happened after the last video is I wanted to go look into this parable of the candle under the bushel because you'll notice that when we went through this, and I showed this to you in that previous video around the mustard seed, you see, Matthew, it goes chapter 11, 11, 13, 13, 13, 13. Oh, there's going to be a change here. Maybe I should look into that, right? But these numbers were being kept in order. Matthew was going four, four, four. Oh, there's a difference, <coughs> which means there's probably something here I should look into. 
But what had happened at first is we saw this seven, like in Luke, seven, seven, eight, and then all of a sudden 13, and then eight, nine. Why the sudden jump to 13? And there was this revelation of everything surrounding the stories of the mustard seed in Luke, Mark, and Matthew. But what I wanted to do is in Mark's, in chapter 4, where the mustard seed is also in chapter 4, there was a story that followed, which was a candle under a bushel. But in Luke's, the candle under the bushel wasn't in chapter 13 with the mustard seed. It was on its own in chapter 8. And so I decided to go have a look into it and see what these connections were. So check this out. It's so awesome. Again, you're going to see this direct connection to what we've been talking about with this, with this remnant portion of workers. Listen to this. So in Luke chapter 8, verse 16, no man, when he has lighted a candle, Okay, when he has lit a candle, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a candlestick that they which enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither is anything hid that shall not be known to come abroad. Okay, now we're going to go into these words, but look at what Mark says. In Mark chapter 4, look at what it says, starting in verse 21. It says, And he said unto them, Is a candle brought to be put under bought to be sorry, brought to be put under a bushel or under a bed and not set on a candlestick? You see anything about light here? They have no they have no light. They're meant to have light, but there's no mention of light to them. For there is nothing hid which shall not be made manifest, neither was anything kept secret that it should come abroad. So even the wording is a little bit different. Meaning, when you go to, when you go to Luke chapter 8, there's something about something having been lit, and those who will see that that has been lit be the light, it will be manifested and be sent abroad for everybody to see. Who do you think that is, guys? It's the remnant workers. Do you remember how we've taught that it is the light of the Lord? When he comes after the wedding and he knocks on the door and we open unto him, that remnant group, whoever they will be, open the door to him, what is he going to do? He's going to shed his light on us. Remember, he is the rock. We are stones. He is the lamb, we are little lambs. We are, we are little copies of Christ, as we've shared in the past. That those who serve the Lord here during this time, that remnant group, that cover crop, they will be the ones who will sit in his throne with them as he sits in his father's throne with the father. Because why? Because they're co-heirs and they will rule and reign with Christ for the thousand years. So obviously they have to have these same things as Christ does. Not to the full extent of Christ, of course, but they will be given these powers and these abilities as well. So why does Luke's have it? Look at the word lighted a candle. It means to set on fire. He's going to set that disciple remnant worker group on fire with his light. This word for light is used four times, as you saw, and check it out. All four times are in Luke's gospel. All four times are in Luke's gospel. And then what do we see? Watch this. So when he hath lighted, this is him lighting the remnant workers. He's going to set them on a candlestick, right? What do they represent? He's going to set them on a candlestick. Wait a second. On a candlestick, you mean like the seven churches? Because what are the seven churches? Or is it uh, Revelation 1? What are the seven churches? Right? The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest on my right hand, and of the seven golden candlesticks. 
the seven stars of the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches so what church do you think is the candlestick that's being lit smyrna smyrna and how do we know it's the lord giving it to them well look at what it says that they which enter in may see the light so this light that's been lit which is the remnant workers of Smyrna, the candlestick of the, Smyrch, the church of Smyrna are being given what? The light of who? Jesus. Remember this? Jesus is represented by this light. I find it very interesting that it's 70 times as well. You know why it's really interesting that it's 70 times? Because 70 ends right here and the first ending of 70 to the father like 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 uh daniel 9 is at the feast of weeks right 70 shabua 70 feasts of weeks and who shows up for this group jesus right the lord shows up to let them know to be ready when he returns from the wedding that's the first group he appears to right before the pre-trib happens and then what happens when the 70 years comes to an end here, what's the very first, very next thing that happens? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, what happens? The Lord returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. So after 70, he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives. And after 70 for the Shabuas, here he is to the remnant workers. Funny how that works, right? And the word for light for Jesus is used 70 times. Now, how do I know that that light is for Jesus? Well, let me show you. First of all, what do we know Jesus came to do? He came, but, right? I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we know what this relates to. This relates all the way back to the beginning of creation, the gap theory portion, those in the spirit, and then in the days of creation, when he was made light. So if he came when he was made light, which we remember this from Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning was Taurus, 16th day of Taurus, which is this coming Friday into Saturday, begins the seventh Sabbath count. And then what do we have? Then the days of creation begin in verse 3. And it says, let there be light and there was light. Who was this light? Jesus. He was the beginning in spirit. Then the Father made him light. And so if Jesus was made light and these guys were in light, then what was the creation of these beings in his image? Light. They were made in his image, which was light. We proved this out from the story of John. Right? John chapter 1 proved out the same thing. In the beginning was the word. Like the gap theory, it was the spirit portion that came first. And then what happened? Then it goes on to talk about John and there was one coming who would shine his light in the darkness, but the dark darkness comprehended it not. John wasn't that light, but he bore witness of the light. This uppercase L is that Jesus light. So if we go to John chapter one, that connection to when Jesus was made light to prove that what we're seeing in Luke chapter 8 is that is a group having received the light of Jesus. We come to chapter uh, verse 7 of John 1, and the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. What is that light? Bang, there it is. Same one. G5457. It's the light of Jesus. So this group in Luke 8 is the Smyrna candlestick being lit to be the light, having received the light of the Lord, that will then do what? Spread his light to all of the Mark group, to all of those in the typology of the days of creation who he came for represented as the house of Israel for which the Gentiles are also grafted into. It represents the whole world. It's the light. And they're going to be given this light. So let me show you something else. 
when we go to John chapter 8. Let's prove this out in John chapter 8. Again, we're going to be able to prove that Jesus is this light. We see a woman, again, taken in adultery. She's going to be stoned, right? We always show this of this typology of the bride. Do I believe that this is the pre-trib bride? I think you can say it's both like the, the pre-trib bride, and you could also say it's a picture of the remnant portion because they're all the leia, the, the winter wheat, first fruits of the wheat harvest going up to the Lord in the pre-trib. But a portion of them are remaining as his cover crop to serve him. And look at what we see when we come down to John 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light. There it is again. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. We know this is directly connected to Isaiah 9 as well when he comes to begin his 40 days. It's awesome. It's awesome. It's showing you in, in Luke chapter 8 when Jesus returns, giving this group of people, this Smyrna candlestick, the light that they will go and shine his light in the world to what? To wake up his people, to, to bring about the greatest revival in human history in the midst of chaos. So that when the great multitude rapture happens, it will be the largest in ever imagined history, which I believe will be over 1.2 billion people, of which maybe, you know, several hundred million will have already died within the tribulation, having come to Christ. But the majority will still be alive at the great multitude rapture. They will be all those who will have received the light of the Lord through that remnant worker group who were lit with his light now check this out want to see it get another step awesome here's this woman right well if you remember in luke chapter 13 when we were showing what was surrounding the mustard seed and we had this woman who was bent over and couldn't lift herself up we showed this also as the typology of the bride right the pre-trib bride which is going to happen on the 8th of Av, which relates to the Sabbath day when the bride is taken. And this woman being disabled who could not lift herself up. Look at this word. For this woman who could not lift up herself. She could not rise herself, be elated, right? Look up. This word is used four times. Well, what if I told you we have another woman here directly connected to the same pre-trib picture, but I think even more specifically, not only the, the remnant portion, not, sorry, not only the portion that's taken as winter wheat, but even maybe more specifically the, the portion that is chosen to remain as the cover crop more specifically even being spoken about here because listen to what happens okay and moses in the law so we've got the woman caught in adultery they say hey, the, that moses tells us in the law that she should be stoned right we know this word for stone don't we and in verse 7 it says so when they continued asking him he lifted up himself and said unto them he that is without sin among you, let him cast a stone at her. Jesus is the only one without sin who can cast that stone. Jesus is the one who's going to cast the stone. And Jesus is the one with the power to lift up. Jesus is the one with the power to lift up, to raise them up. Okay? So let's see what this connection is with this him standing in the standing in the woman in the midst of her and then him rising up, him lifting himself up and then saying, go and sin no more. Why do we have this and go and sin no more? This is, I believe, connected more so where where Luke chapter 
uh, 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 13 about this woman that comes first with the Sabbath day, I believe is more of a reflection of that pre-trib bride being taken. And I think more so now that this woman here in this being caught in adultery stuff is related to that remnant portion of the cover crop. Okay. Now watch what happens. This is when we know he's coming to begin his 40 days. Okay. So now watch what happens. Look at the word lifted up. Here it is. It's only used four times. It's G352. We go to G352 and check it out. It's only used four times, twice in John 8, verse 7 and 10, which are the two places where Jesus, the one who has the power to lift up, is lifting himself up in the midst of the story of the woman and his beginning 40 days when he's now going to shot. He is the light. And anybody who comes to him, he, he has lit the candlestick of that remnant portion of the bride of Smyrna. And look at where it's found. Luke 13, 11, And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. Who's the one that could lift up? Jesus. This is what we were saying. It's directly connected to the last uh, two videos ago in relation to the story of the mustard seed and what came first, which was talking about the pre-trib and the events after in the above. And then in Mark's was the events of seals. And then in Matthew was the events of trumpets. It was a wild, wild video to see that revealed in the way the stories in the chapter laid out within each one surrounding the mustard seed. But look at the other place where it's found, brothers and sisters. Luke 21, 28. Almost like we're seeing the one for the pre-trib bride being taken, which relates to Luke 13, and the one for the remnant bride who is remaining in Luke 21, 28, who is like this woman that Jesus is standing in the midst of, and he's the only one that can cast a stone at her, because why? Because he's the only one without sin. And what do we know about Luke 21, 28? In Luke 21, chapter, uh, verse 28, check it. Look at what we see. We'll start in verse 25. And there were signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. When do we know that begins, brothers and sisters? Does that begin before the pre-trib? Nope. It begins for the week after. During the week after the pre-trib is when this all begins. Look at this. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming upon or on, I should say, literally on, arriving, impending on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Who's going to see this? I don't think the world is going to see him coming. They're not going to know this is the Lord, even if he's in a cloud. Who's going to recognize this coming? His remnant bride. That remnant bride worker, the, the cover crop that was told to wait for him when he returns from the wedding. What are we seeing? The stones throw. The stone's throw is going to be taking place in the midst of the wedding week in heaven. And then what does he come? Then he comes after the seventh day of the wedding in heaven. And he's coming on the eighth day to begin his 40 days as he said he would as Jonah. And what do we see? When they see him coming, when the, when the remnant will see him coming on the clouds, it says, which is the start of his 40 days. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads. For your redemption draweth nigh. And look at the word. It's the look up one. This is awesome. It's so awesome how that one word connects us back to the same video where we were talking about it being connected to the pre-trib and from it, a group of remnant workers who are connected with the lifted up on whom he's going to shed his light when he comes for 40 days is all directly related to it. I thought that was so cool. It was it was just another one of those, man, 
it just continues and continues and it gets deeper and deeper and more and more detailed. Because what we saw, what we just read there in Luke, is this period of time right here. There are no events. Oh, it doesn't mean things won't build up and maybe we'll see some things taking place that will really be increasing on the earth between, you know, now and the next uh, 52, 53 days, 53, 54 days. But actual events that the whole world is going to see and say, oh, my goodness. No, it will begin with the pre-trip. So exciting. It's so awesome to to even the the um, the thought that we could possibly actually be here. It's incredible. Now, hopefully we won't hit uh, too many commercials with this, but we're now going to go into the story with Josiah. It's so wild. When you see, as I said in the beginning, when you see how it's connected to Laodicea, and we know that we are in Laodicea, we know that we are in Laodicea, and we know when it's when Laodicea ends, when the pre-trib happens, the seven churches start over again with the 50 days, and then through seals to the end of the seventh year of seals, and through trumpets to the end of trumpets, and then it's Laodicea again at the end of trumpets, right? In the second half of trumpets. It's, it's exactly what you're about to hear, how we're in Laodicea now, and there's a picture of it now, to when the Lord comes to, to begin trumpets time at the end of seals, to what he's going to battle during trumpets, to something happening to him at the end of trumpets, and then which will lead to his return feet down on the Mount of Olives. All of this and much more is in this story of Josiah, even where these things are. Remember how we revealed um, uh, a couple of videos, or I guess a few videos back now, in relation to the book of Numbers, I think it was Numbers 19, and how it related to all this with uh, Bilal, <coughs> right, with Pergamum, right, with Bilal and, and the other one that was with him, related to the typology of, of when the Antichrist gets his power. And then we showed with First Kings, uh, First Kings, Second Kings, this connection that was there as well that brought us to this time when he would take over and be high priest and king when, he, when he's going to be reigning as Melchizedek when he comes. It, it's so awesome. Well, what we're going to see now is a little glimpse of this when he comes because he's going to be what? It's going to relate to first kings, which relates to the kings of Israel. And then you got the kings of Judah relating to second chronicles. It's amazing when you really dig into the, the was, the is, and the is to come. And we've shared on this, for those of you who haven't heard it before, this is from the Ministry Revealed book. If you want a paperback, you can go get it on Amazon or an ebook. but you can also download it for free in uh, on ministryrevealed.com. Uh, and I think you can download it in five languages. So that's uh, very exciting as well. But this is the one um, in relation to the seven churches. And so you've got the was of church history, right, or of history, in the Old Testament, so this playing out of about 2,500 years, then you've got the is that we're in right now, which is where we are right now at the very tail end of apostasy time in Laodicea, which has been about 2,000 years. And we're told in Scripture, in, in uh, Ecclesiastes 1.9, what was shall be, what is shall be. Nothing new under the sun. So you've got typologies of the seven churches from the Old Testament. You've got, of course, the seven churches and how they played out in approximate year time frames over the last 2,000 years in the is. And the is to come when Laodicea ends at the pre-trib, at the moment of the pre-trib taking, the seven churches will begin again with Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. And it plays out over 50 days and 14 years. It's a wild, wild revelation. And when you understand and go into this with Exodus and Numbers and First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you see the exact same storyline that we've proved out in the is and how it relates to the is to come. It's, it's absolutely incredible. And so we're going to see this 
in relation to where we are right now. Okay, we are in Laodicea right now. Are we expecting something in Laodicea, brothers and sisters? Is there something that comes at the very beginning, right before the pre-trib in Laodicea? Right before the moment of the pre-trib and the seven churches start over again? There's something that happens right here in this Laodicea. We're going to touch on it. Okay? But I'll wait until we get to this section. I want you guys to hear this little piece first that confirms what we've shared on in relation to understanding the not the timing of his jubilee. We're not going into that, but how to count it. This is just a few seconds. Listen to this. Went back to Leviticus because Leviticus says you'll count seven just by seven, 49 years, and then comes the 50th year. Now, the 50th year is not when you turn 50. It's when you finish turning 49, and then that begins your 50th year. And then you complete it when you turn 50. It's over. Aha, uh -huh. did you hear that? How many times have you heard me saying that here in this ministry? The Jubilee year isn't the number 50 and then what follows after the 51. No, it's the 49th year ends at the number 49. So it's like my age. As soon as I turned, I'm not 41 and 49 anymore, but as soon as I turned 49 years old, I have completed 49 years of my life. You see? And so on at 49 years and one day, I have now on that day one after I've turned, when I've had my 49th birthday as we celebrate them, I have actually begun the very next day my 50th year. So you're actually in your 50th year once 49 is complete. And that's what he's saying. That is the Jubilee. The Jubilee is as soon as 49, the number is reached the very next day in a 365-day year. The very next day is the beginning of the 50th year. Okay? That was just a little something I wanted to add in there that confirms uh, what we've been sharing on that for years as well. So now let's get to this next section into into josiah oh, hopefully we won't get too oh, many commercials Come on. Oh, my i actually God. bought one of those really <laughs> this is this so that commercial you just saw i bought a four pack uh not i'm not getting a promo for it i bought a four pack having seen it i thought it was a great idea i've got it from my in-laws my brother-in-law sister-in-law and then for my grand my in-law my parents in-law right and uh, then we've got a couple in our house. So that was just a little side note. <laughs> this is the broken altar moment. Amen. It, folks, it is revival or bust. Huh. See, I had to share that. Revival or bust. That's probably most likely going to be the name of this video. Revival or bust or bust and revival. Okay. I'm probably actually going to name it bust and revival because this is... That, that kind of period, they don't really understand. They understand that we're in the age of apostasy. They understand that we are at the time in, in the Laodicean age, as I showed here. We know that we're in the Laodicean age. The whole church world knows that we're in the Laodicean age, the age of apostasy. And yet, they're expecting a revival? Do you know why? Because they think everything of the end of days is going to play out during the period of Laodicea because they haven't understood as we've been revealed that as soon as the pre-trib happens the seven churches will play over again in the 50 days and 14 years so what are they what are they always expecting they're always looking for the great revival I mean and it's fine you should be looking for it. you should be trying to start a revival and there are little pockets that happen here and there. But people have been talking about it for 40 years. You know why it hasn't really happened, even though people have been working so hard to ha make it happen? It's because we're in the age of Laodicea. There's no great revival in the age of Laodicea. It's not possible in an age of apostasy. Why do I bring this up? Because revival or bust in the age of Laodicea is impossible. You must have bust. 
than revival, which means tribulation. And that's what he's saying. It's either we're going to have revival or bust, meaning everything's about to break out. Well, the answer is everything's going to be is going to break out in bust, and then revival will begin in the midst of the chaos. I don't think there's really any in between, um, which brings us yes. to Josiah. Yes, the namesake of the book, the Josiah Manifesto. Uh, one of my heroes in the Bible, <laughs> no doubt. Tell us about Josiah yeah. and how all of this is connected to this ancient biblical king. Yeah, all these mysteries we've touched, we've just touched on, are really converging to this one answer and to the broken altar. But the broken altar is speaking of Josiah. There's nobody in the Bible who is more connected to the broken altar than Josiah. His actual his his birth was prophesied centuries before he was born. With, a, with God breaking the altar at Bethel. I mean, think about that, you know. And this would be the guy who is, who's known for breaking more altars. Because, because he, you know, he, and he actually went down to the Valley of Hinnom and ended those altars where they were killing the babies. So this is totally Josiah. And, you know, we are, you know, so literally, the, this, is, this is the man who was born in a, a time of great apostasy. You know, the, the, first of all, the day of Josiah, the days of, are the days we're in right now. Because it Okay, so right off the bat, so the days of Josiah are the days that we are in right now. Why do I bring this up? Because, of course, if we go to Revelation chapter 3, for which everybody knows we are in the days of Laodicea in the age of apostasy. But what do we know is going to take place right before the age of apostasy is over. Well, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. What do we know about this? We know exactly what this is related to. This is a picture of the Lord right before the moment of the pre-trip. Now, when I say right before, I don't know if it's hours before, minutes before, seconds before, but we know it's momentarily before, and we get the answer and the understanding of it from Luke chapter 12, starting in verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And you yourselves, like unto men that wait for their Lord when he will return from the wedding. By the way, yes, this is only in Luke. That when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom their Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to eat and will come forth and serve them. This is the first watch group of the SEALs, workers, that group of the cover crop, that, lay, that um, uh, Smyrna group that will be with them for the 40 days. But what does he tell them first? It appears that the scripture is telling us that the Lord is going to appear to them some moments before the pre-trib happens and the bride is, is gone at the pre-trib, and he goes to the wedding. It would appear he's going to let them know moments before it happens. We've explained why in the past, right? The reason makes complete sense. Because the whoever is going to be chosen to remain and serve him as Laodicea, as the ones who receive that light and bring it out into the world from him in his light. Could you imagine knowing that you're watching and praying and you're diligently seeking and searching the Lord. You're love, you love him, you're repentant, you're loving to others. And the pre-trib happens and you've been left? That would be a panic. That would be, a, that would be chaos. Especially for those that love the Lord and are in Christ spirit-filled. This eliminates that fear for the remnant workers. The Lord or an angel of the Lord will appear to the remnant workers and let them know to be ready when they when he returns from the wedding 
which when he returns, we know is after the seven day pre trib wedding, when he's coming on the eighth day. And what is he going to do? Like Luke 24, he's going to sit down and serve them and have a meal with them. Could you imagine? This is the stuff I was talking about with you before in the beginning that I spoke about with Mike as well. Just just the, the thought. How on earth would the remnant workers, knowing that they're now in the presence of Christ when he's returned from the wedding, the creator of all of it, of everything, and we are in his presence, how, like Mike said, you know, be crying so much, snot coming out of our noses, and it would just be a mess. We would all be a mess on our faces, on the dirt. And how would we be able to sustain ourselves knowing that we're in his presence? Something's got to happen like all of the, you know, the, the prophets and all those people in the past, right? Where, where an angel of the Lord, you know, either touches their mouth or a hot coal touches or something that sets their spirit at ease. Because knowing, how would you be able to sustain it? Right? Just wild, wild stuff. So see, we know that that portion is coming first. We know this in the age of apostasy, which is directly connected to what he's saying, which is being in the age of apostasy and the age of apostasy being connected to the timing of the start of Josiah. And we have it right here. What do we know about the timing of the end of the story with Josiah? It's in... 321 revelation 321 to him that overcometh cometh i will grant uh to him that overcometh will i grant to sit with me in my throne even as i also have overcome and am set down with my father in his throne when will this group of people who served him having put their necks on the line get to sit in the throne with the lamb while he sits in the throne with his father uh in his father's throne with his father it's the resurrection of the just right the first resurrection those who are going to reign with christ a thousand years those who will be glorified with him as we've read in romans chapter 8. well when is this this is at the end of tribulation so at the end of Laodicea, when it wraps around again at the end of tribulation, it'll be the resurrection and those who have part in the first resurrection who put their necks on the line and will not taste of the second death. They shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So you've got them there at the very beginning, at the very tip end of Laodicea. And then you've got them at the end of it with Laodicea. And who is he going to represent? Who are we seeing him as a representation of here? We're seeing him as Josiah, as you're about to witness. And you just heard him say that Josiah is that typology figure because his age represented Laodicea. So do you understand? Did you, do you remember why I was saying this earlier? 70. And 70, 70 coming to the end, which is at the end of the 13th year. And boom, he comes feet down. 70 coming to the end. And what do we see? The very first thing he does is meets with that remnant group right before he takes the pre-trip. End of 70, end of 70. The, the Josiah type and the Josiah type. Watch this. Have a good, a good life. He ends up turning his heart to the Lord despite his age, despite the culture. He became king at the age of eight? Yes. And this yes. is all laid out, folks, in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles. All right. So just in that little clip, then you got to say, well, wait a second. This is all laid out in 2 Kings and 2 Chronicles? So, of course, all we got to do is use a program like Blue Letter Bible. This is, of course, free. This is just a website online. And what do we do? Well, we do the word search, right? That's why a program like this one right here, eSword that I use, I think it's a few bucks a year, five, ten, nine bucks a year, whatever it is, depending on your device. And when you use the KJV Plus, you get all of the word definitions right at your fingertips. So now, 
when I go do my searches with words, I like using Blue Letter Bible. And look at where Blue Letter Bible shows up. Starts off in 1 Kings, then it goes 2 Kings, 2 Kings, then it goes into Chronicles. In 2 Chronicles, we're going to go and explore some of these storylines in 1 and 2 Kings and going into Chronicles and see where it leads us. Because not only is this picture to start off being related just like at his birth and the Lord did these things and here we are talking about this period of time of 70 coming to the end and the Lord appearing to that group first why why am I talking about this 70 being at the beginning and at the end well we've shared on it before and we know it we know that there's the when they come into the land and then doing the count and then we know that there's a count for for Jerusalem from 1967 until 70 years ends there We've often gone to 2 Chronicles chapter 36, and what have we shown in this? We've shown the story with Nebuchadnezzar and Zedekiah. We've shown how it's that 70 years coming to an end to fulfill 70 years, and that when the 70 years, then the land has enjoyed her Sabbaths, right? We know that the land has to remain vacant. That's why Jerusalem will be destroyed, and they won't rebuild the temple until seven years later. And then we've got the start. So we've shown this in a typology of the 70 years coming to an end here. But what you're also going to see is it's also going to be a typology of 70 years coming to an end here. But this one, in relation to it, is the typology of, uh, of Josiah, the, the typology of Christ in a Josiah type. But we've shown it over here before. Because we know when Cyrus comes, Cyrus is the one who makes the decree. And within Cyrus's seven years, only the foundation was laid. And we know in the midst of seals, only the foundation will get rebuilt in Jerusalem during the time of the first seven years of seals. And then when the Lord returns on heavenly Mount Zion, the 144 sealed, the great multitude rapture happens. And... Then the seven years of trumpets begins. The Lord is there on Mount Zion. Zerubbabel, who laid the foundation, whoever modern-day Zerubbabel is, they will now start rebuilding the city, the streets, and the temple, and they'll have three and a half years in which that will get done. Okay, all of these things we've taught on before. But now, what else do we know? Well, we know that Cyrus is also a type of Messiah, right? He is a type. And when I say Messiah, I mean an anointed one. Cyrus was an anointed one, and we all know this. So it's almost like a typology in what we're seeing as the Lord returning feet down and him saying, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me. Sound familiar? You see, so not only, I wanted you guys that have been around for a while to understand I'm not trying to bring confusion and saying, well, wait, is it the first 70 years coming to an end? Or is it the, the Judah, Jerusalem count 70 years coming to an end? It's a typology of both. We've often showed the one that is coming up now. And we've broken it all down. We've gone into the other books. We, we've shown it. I'm showing you the kind of the end of what you're going to see in relation to how Josiah gets us to this point, and then how Cyrus is a picture of the Lord returning feet down when all the kingdoms of the earth are now his. Look at when we see that same wording. We see the same wording at the seventh trumpet. Remember, Revelation chapter 10 says, at the beginning of the sound of the seventh trumpet, the mystery is over. Because the, that's the Lord in Zechariah 14 seen coming feet down on the Mount of Olives, when it'll be now the second sword, the, the Revelation 19 destruction and everything else. Well, look at what it says. Revelation 11:15. 15. Uh, the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our, of our Lord and his Christ. Sound familiar? And the kingdoms of this world are become our Lord's and his Christ. It's the same thing we were reading. So we're getting this 
typology of it being the end of both 70s. This first 70 that we're in right now and the 70 that will come to an end after the 13th year of tribulation when Cyrus, as the typology of an anointed Messiah, receives all the kingdoms of the earth that the Lord God has given him. Crazy how it works, right? Well, now I'm going to show you how we get to 2 Chronicles 36 when we're actually talking about Zedekiah, uh, um, uh, Josiah. So let's start where Josiah starts. Josiah shows up in 1 Kings 13. So when we go to our chapters, I mean, our uh, seven churches revelation, look at this. First and second Kings is the period relating to the church reformation, which relates to Sardis, which you guys know as what? The seventh year of seals. There's the beginning of the 50 days. There's the beginning of the 40 days, which is starts on the eighth day after the start of 50. These two groups are here during seals. This is about mid seals when the beast gets his power and authority to continue 42 months. It continues through to the end of the sixth year of seals. See, see them both still in the wilderness time. This is the end of the sixth year of seals. The Lord coming on heavenly Mount Zion, the church of the Reformation, which is the is of what happened and relates to first and second Kings, <coughs> excuse me, which takes us all into that first portion of uh, the very to the end of seals and the start of the seven years of trumpet judgments. So if we go to first Kings chapter 13. We see this wording in first Kings. Let's go to it where Josiah shows up. And we see in first Kings chapter 13 verse 2 and he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said O altar altar thus saith the Lord behold a child shall be born unto the house of David a child shall be born unto the house of David and we're talking about remember we're talking about a duality thing going on right he's relating to the end of 70 with Shabua, right the end of 70 but at the end of his of his life it's also going to relate to the end of 70 so it's the end and then it relates to it starting again and then the end being 70 which is again exactly as we've shown in our chart the end of 70 it starts the end of 70 he brings it all to an end in the 14th year so we're seeing this for unto us a child is born. We know this, of course, from Luke chapter 2, which relates to for unto us, right, when Jesus was born. Jesus is born, a picture now of his 40 days. We're getting that picture of it, right? Go back to 1 Kings. Uh, where was I? Chapter 13. Let's see what else. We've got a sign given on the day. According to the word, the man of God, okay? That was the beginning. So we're seeing for unto us a child is born, right? Behold, a child shall be born of the house of David. We're getting this picture of a typology of Christ with this same wording. You can continue in 2 Kings. Now go to chapter 21 and look what happens. 21 and then when we go into chapter 22. So now what are we going to see? <clears throat> Now we're going to see in this picture here of the end of days, we're going to see what? Well, we should see then the Lord here because he's come now, right? He's coming at the end of the sixth seal. He's going to be here during the seventh year. He's going to seal the 144. It's going to be the great multitude rapture. There's going to be silence in heaven for half an hour. And now on Mount Zion, then the 144 will go out. And the rebuilding of the city and the streets and the temple will begin. And he is high priest and king. And Zerubbabel is there with him. They rule together, as Zechariah 6 says. And he, Zerubbabel is going to oversee all of the rebuilding. Okay? So it'll be in the eighth year of the end of days, right? In the 14 years. In the big picture, 
Remember, let's not forget, we've got the big picture of the 21 years, which means we'll also have something that if you go 7 and 7, that's 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. So that means something should happen maybe that we'll see that if Josiah is coming in here and then something happening connected to the 18th year in the big picture, we might be able to see something there. So we might be able to see something in the 14-year count, in the big picture, the 18th year, like John 18, right? Like uh, like uh, 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 um, Genesis 18, you know, something in connection with the 18th year in the big picture. And maybe we can even get something connected in the year count. Wonder if, wonder if we can see those types of things in this. Yes, of course, I'm setting you up. <laughs> All right. So now look at what happens. When we come to Luke, uh, uh, sorry, uh, 2 Kings chapter 22. Let me just reconfirm where I'm at. Second, sorry, 2 Kings chapter 21. So we're in 2 Kings chapter 21. And listen to what we read about. It says, uh, Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was this. Um, and then right here, we see another little picture of things that have taken place. Remember, in the typology of the time frames, remember, this played out over thousands of years, a couple thousand years. This played out over a couple thousand years. This is going to play out over 50 days and 14 years, which means if we know a period of time when Josiah shows up and begins to rule, then whatever we're seeing just before he takes rule is related to the period of seals. Okay? You'll understand what I'm saying. Here was numbers, and then all of a sudden we're going to go into the Kings and Chronicles. So what happens is before Josiah shows up in the typology of him being Christ, so not only is it this picture of the very tail end of Laodicea, and then when it's all over the Laodicea picture again, it's also a picture of the time of Christ when he comes on Mount Zion and is here during trumpets. Because remember, the Lord is coming when he returns at the end of the sixth year. So he is here during the seventh year of seals. He is still here during the first three and a half years of trumpets. And he is still here in a war that breaks out when Satan is cast down for the next two and a half years. So he's here for the seventh year of seals. He's here for the first three and a half years of trumpets and the rebuilding in the city and the streets and the 144 going out who he is over and watching over. And then Satan is cast down. Satan's got two and a half years. And in this two and a half years is war that breaks out against him and Zerubbabel and them until what? Until the again happens. So the Lord is here at the end of the sixth seal. From that point forward, he is here in one manner or another. All the way to the end. Sometimes we forget about that. But the revelation had showed us that for a long time. So we know that he's here for this entire time in certain battles and doing certain things. So when we come in here and we're reading what it says, we're seeing this as before Josiah takes over as king. So listen to what it says here. In 2 Kings 21, verse 2, it says, And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord after the abominations of the heathen. So Manasseh, in this typology, related to the period of time of seals before Josiah shows up, is something that happened with when the beast and abomination takes place and doing evil in the sight of the Lord. What was this abomination? In relation to the is-to-come typology, it's the time of the mark of the beast. It's Mark's abomination of desolation when they're to flee because it's the Revelation 13 time of the mark of the beast. 
So this is what we're seeing. Look, and he had set up graven image. The image of the beast. Look at what it says here in verse 6. And he made his son to pass through the fire and observe times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set as graven image. It's all related to this mid seals, to the end of the seals judgments, to the end of the sixth year of seals. Verse 11, because Messiah, king of Judah, had done these abominations and had done wickedly above all the Amorites did, which were before him, and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols. There it is again. So now, what happens to him? Verse 20, it says, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his father Manasseh did, right? The son did next. And he walked in all the way that his father walked and served idols that his father served and worshipped them all relating to a picture of seal still and he forsook forsook the lord god of his fathers and walked not in the way of the lord verse 24 uh and the people in the land um slew all them that conspired against king ammon and the people of the land made josiah his son king in his stead verse 26 and he was buried in the sepulcher in the goal in the garden of Uzzah and Josiah his son reigned as king what are we seeing here now we're seeing the picture of now Josiah Josiah now coming and taking over at the end of seals so we've now come to the end of seals He's destroyed all the enemies. And now what we're going to see is the beginning of the trumpet judgments time, the, the trumpet portion, the seven years of trumpets. Okay. Now we're going to go in to this period of time here. Look at what it says. Okay. Now Josiah is officially taking over as king. Watch this. Let's follow it next. Let's see what comes. Let's go into Second Kings chapter 22. Watch what happens here. This gets wild. So it says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. Let me show you something. Look at this typology. Okay. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. So in the eighth year, of the 14th year of tribulation, which is the first year of trumpets, the Lord is reigning on heavenly Mount Zion. And what is it? It's the eighth year. Well, it gets better. It says, and he reigned 31 years. Okay? Let's look at just the typology. What year will it be? 2031. In the eighth year. Look what it says next. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Okay, he was well favored. He did everything that was right in the sight of the Lord. It said, never turned aside to the right or to the left. Okay, and walked in all the way of David, his father. Verse three, and it came to pass, listen to this, in the 18th year of King Josiah, the scribe. Okay, watch this. Came to pass what? What is the big picture? 777, that would mean the 11th year of the 14 years of tribulation is, in the big picture, the 18th year. So we've got him being 8. We've got a connection to 31 years later, being in 2031. And we know that this is also the 13th year. In fact, here's our other chart that shows the big picture, right? So there's the 18th year. So in the big picture, the 18th year is this same period of time, okay? And what does it say? And it came to pass in the 18th year of King Josiah, and then it names all the names, a scribe of the house of the Lord, saying, verse 4, Go up to Hilkiah the high priest, that, the sum, that he may sum the silver which is brought into the house of the Lord. Does that sound familiar? 
Does that sound familiar to you guys? The story of Judas bringing the 30 pieces of silver and them throwing it into the house of the Lord, right? Throwing it into the treasury. It's the story of what? We know where this story is. Wait a second. Zechariah 11. What if we go have a quick look into Zechariah 11 and see if we see the same story in Zechariah 11? When Jesus has to break his covenant. What happens? Verse 12. And I said unto them, if you think good, if you think, give me my price. And if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And what they do, the, 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 verse 13, And the Lord said unto me, Cast it unto the potter a goodly price that I was priced at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver and cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord. The exact same story. We've revealed it many times. In relation to why only 30 pieces is literally mentioned in Matthews, but not in Luke and not in Mark's. It's part of the revelation of the differences in the Gospels. But it goes beyond the revelation of the differences in the Gospels because it also reveals this revelation of the chapters to years. Go to Zechariah chapter 11. There's the revelation of the money, which is the picture of Judas when he does this, which in the big picture is the 18th year and here we are in second kings chapter 22 which in the seven uh, uh churches of the end of days would be this time right here relating from second kings going into chronicles the time when the lord begins to rule until the time he's what until the time he's cut off when does the lord get cut off when war is going to break out against them, when the sum of money of the 30 pieces of silver, the, the denial of Judas and what took place in the is, is a picture of the 18th year or of the 11th year of the 14, when in the midst of the 11th, which is about 10 and a half years into tribulation, when Satan is cast down, right? This is when Satan is then cast down three and a half years after the city and the streets and everything were rebuilt, and then Satan's going to have two and a half years to make war against the witnesses and chaos on the earth. It's the, it's the direct connection to Judas and the silver. Let's keep going. What is it going to bring? Well, let's have a read. Let's go back up to 2 Kings. Where was I? Chapter, uh, yeah, chapter 22. So we saw all these connections. And then it says, in 2 Kings 22, 13, Go ye, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the people, and for all Judah, concerning the words of this book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us, because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that is written concerning us. Verse 15, And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord. So now this prophetess, right? <clears throat> Hulda, this prophetess, she says, uh, And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent me to you, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of this book, which the king of Judah had read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. Wait a second. What happens at mid-trumpets? What happens at this point of the silver? It's, it's Revelation chapter 12, right? It's, it's Revelation chapter 12 when we see that Satan has been cast down. 
when Satan is cast down, the pit is opened. When he lost his battle in heaven against Michael and his angels, he gets cast down and he knows he has but a short time. And that is the first woe, which is the fifth trumpet, which is at mid trumpets in the 11th year, 10 and a half years into tribulation. Directly related to the time of cutting off. And what else is it? We're now in Matthew's portion because we're in the seven years of trumpets. And what happens at this point? It's the abomination of desolation in Matthew because the holy place has now been rebuilt. It's this great evil that is now being released. He's telling them this wrath of this great evil that's being released now upon them. And let's see what it keeps going on to say. It says, uh, so verse 18 of 2 Kings 22. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, as touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord. When thou heardest what I spoke, against this place and against the inhabita the inhabitants thereof that they should become a desolation and a curse and has rent thy clothes and wept before me i have also heard thee saith the lord you see this is all josiah and in his doing so is the lord going to bring this against him well no because in the typology we know that jesus is the josiah type here so Josiah isn't going to have to actually, you know, contend with these things being against him, even though he's going to battle against them. These things aren't specifically against him, right? Because we know he is a picture of the Lord. And in the end, you know, we know how it plays out. But this is when the wrath, when the pit is going to open and this evil is going to be brought upon them. He says, uh, then she goes on to say uh, in verse 20, Behold, therefore, I will gather unto thee, uh, sorry, I will gather thee unto thy fathers and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. Which means what? Well, if we know that there's going to be a battle and everything that's going to break out, we know the Lord is here during this time and that it's breaking out and he's going to fight against it. But when it's over, he's going to be in the grave, which we know is what? The again that he has to do, right, for the priestly line. You can, we used to say, you know, maybe Judah, but it's really connected to the priestly line because their sacrifice of the ox hasn't taken place yet, of the bull, right? And then what? Then the return feet down. So now... We could see what's taking place. It's all about to be released. And now we go to, where are we? Now we go to, we showed that, we showed that. Now we're going to go into Second Chronicles and see how this story plays out. So we went into uh, where he first shows up in 1 Kings 13, in 1 Kings 21, 1 Kings 22. And then we're going to go now into Second Chronicles, and we're going to begin just briefly as an overview in chapter 34. So in chapter 34, we see chapter 34 is, is another uh, overview of what took place and has other details within it of how it all began with Josiah. What happens after chapter 34? Well, of course, chapter 35. <laughs> I'm, I'm a genius, right? So we go from chapters Chronicles, chapter 34. Now we're going to follow into chapter 35. And it's because chapter 34 was just showing us that where the story was in First and Second Kings is being reiterated here. So I want you to see how this follows, which is going to lead us to what? Second Chronicles 36, the end of another 70. Right. So we're following the story of Josiah and we come to chapter thirty five. 
Watch what happens in chapter 35. Okay? This gets pretty awesome. In 2 Chronicles 35, it says, Moreover, Josiah kept a Passover unto the Lord in Jerusalem, and they killed the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. And he set his priests in their charge and encouraged them to the service of the house of the Lord and said unto the Levites that taught all Israel. Huh. The priests and the Levites, right? That that hundred and forty four thousand which were holy unto the Lord. Put the holy ark in the house which Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, did build. Okay, remember, the temple was rebuilt in the first half of trumpets. We know this war is breaking out. We're at mid-trumpets, and the pit is open, and this great evil is coming upon them, and war is breaking out. Watch what comes next. In Second Chronicles 35, starting in verse 19. In the 18th year of the reign of Josiah, okay, again, in the 18th year, that prophetic picture, right? In the big picture, the 18th year. Why is it doing that? In the 18th year, which is mid-trumpets, what, what is mid-trumpet judgments? What is this period of time we, we always go to? It's 10 and a half years. It's Psalms 90 and 10. From 70 to 80, and soon the cutoff. Which makes this the period of time of what we saw, the, the silver money. We saw it connected to Judas. We see it connected to Satan being cast down and the first woe. And we see it to Psalms 90 and 10. And we see it now in relation to Josiah. What time of year would it be? If the tribulation is going to start, and it will officially, now, yes, it begins at the pre-trib, and there's the 50 days. But the 14 years begins at the Feast of Trumpets. Right? The end of six years, Jesus is coming on Heavenly Mount Zion on the day and hour no one knows in Mark because he's coming to begin that seventh year of seals at the Feast of Trumpets, the day and hour no one knows six years later or after the six years have passed, and then you've got trumpet judgments. You've got seven years of trumpets. After six, he's coming on the, at the seventh year at the day and hour no one knows, Feast of Trumpets, okay? The 14 years begins at the Feast of Trumpets. So knowing that, and this being a picture of the 18th year, it starts at Feast of Trumpets. What would 10 and a half years later be? The Feast of of Trump, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it would be Passover, right? Feast of Trumpets to 10 years is Feast of Trumpets. Six months later, in the 11th year, which is 10 and a half years, <coughs> excuse me, it would be Passover time. And what did Jesus do? What did Josiah do? What's this picture of what Christ would do? Well, listen to how great this was. Um, let's start in verse 18, 2 Chronicles 35, 18. And there was no Passover like to that kept in Israel from the days of Samuel the prophet. Neither did all the kings of Israel keep such a Passover as Josiah kept. And the priests and the Levites and all Judah and Israel that were present and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. This was a Passover kept like no other what do you think this passover will be like in the end of days when the city and the streets and the temple had just been rebuilt and they're now before right before satan is cast down what do you think this passover is going to be like do you think it would be similar if not actually greater probably most likely a certainty because it will be the Lord in this representation at the ten and a half year mark, having kept a Passover like no other since the one of Josiah? In the 18th year of the reign of Josiah was this Passover kept. After that, when Josiah had prepared 
the temple. Look what happens. Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Kershmish by Euphrates. And Josiah went out against him. And Josiah went out against him. So what do we know this? This is mid-trumpets. He just had this great Passover. The temple's prepared. Now we've got a picture of Satan having been cast down. Okay? Satan, this Pharaoh-type king, having been cast down. We're at mid-trumpets. Right after they had had this great Passover. And Josiah is going to go out against them. What do we know from the book of Revelation? We see in, actually, Revelation, so in Revelation 9, we see when the fifth angel sounds and the pit is going to be opened, and we see in Revelation 11 what takes place under it when it says uh, from verse 4, it says, These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth when they shall have finished their testimony, verse 7, and when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, which is because the beast was killed at the end of the sixth year of seals, he was, he is not in the first half of trumpets, and then at mid-trumpets, he's coming out of the pit, shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. How long does this killing take? Two and a half years. This war breaking out against them, we all know, we've revealed it, that it's going to last two and a half years. From Daniel chapter 9, we've revealed this here from verse uh, 26, that after the seven weeks, seven years, and about three and a half years, which is your seven and three and a half, your ten and a half, then Messiah is cut off. And the people of the prince shall come, shall destroy the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. We know it starts with the flood in Revelation 12, 14 at mid-trumpets when Satan's cast down. And it says, and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. So this brings you right here to 10 and a half years, mid-trumpet judgments into tribulation. And unto the end of the war, this is the final two and a half years from mid-trumpets. 10 and a half plus two and a half brings you to the end of 13 years. And then you've got the final year when the Lord's return feet down. See, unto the end of the war, this is the war against the two witnesses. And we get it in Revelation chapter 12 because, as you guys know, you've seen this before, in verse 7, and swear by him that liveth forever that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. There's no and between time and times. So it's one, two, and a half. Two and a half years when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. You see, to scatter them. Remember, a great evil is being brought, and the people are going to be scattered in destruction and so forth. And when these two and a half years are done, what does it say? And all these things shall be finished. That's because Satan has two and a half years of the final three and a half years of the 14. And in those two and a half years, when it's done, it's the end of the sixth trumpet. That's why the seventh trumpet tells us that um, as soon as the seventh trumpet begins to sound, it's finished. The mystery is finished. Because it's the Lord then returning feet down on the Mount of Olives. So we understand this period of time. We understand what's being said in relation to 2 Chronicles 35. <clears throat> When we see, where am I, where am I, where am I? When we see that Josiah is going out to fight against them. Remember, this relates to the Lord. He is the high priest and king Melchizedek with Zerubbabel and the two of them ruling together. They're a picture. They're representing the two witnesses during, tri during trumpets. They're going to be there the first three and a half, and then war breaks out against them. The war is going to last for two and a half years after what? After this great Passover celebration when the temple and everything has been complete. We know it lasts for two and a half years. 
right? So it's going to last for two and a half years. And what do we know about it? What happens at the end of two and a half years? Well, as we know, the story of Messiah ben Joseph, they say Messiah ben Joseph. Some people will say Messiah ben Ephraim. It means the same thing. Messiah ben Joseph is the Lord when he comes at the end of six years of seals. He represents Messiah ben Joseph through Ephraim as the ox, okay, as the Taurus, as the ram. Uh, sorry, as the as the ox, as the bull, okay? And as Messiah ben Joseph, we know he is the high priest and king just as Joshua was. He's also giving us a picture here in this same representation of being Josiah and going out to battle. Let's see what it says about him. So here's some messianic traditions, what they've been taught down. So from Rashi's commentary of the Talmud gives more details. He explains that Messiah ben Joseph is called a craftsman because he will help rebuild the temple. Now, is Messiah ben Joseph the one rebuilding the temple? No. Messiah ben David, the, the, the branch who is Zerubbabel, exactly as Zechariah tells us, he is the one. He laid the foundation during seals in Zechariah chapter 4. And it says that his hands who laid the foundation will be the one to complete the temple. Messiah ben Joseph, who is the uh, Zerubbabel, uh, who is the um, uh, um, uh, high priest and king like Melchizedek, he's there. Maybe he's, he's seeing it being rebuilt, but he's not the one overseeing it because he's the high priest and king. And he's more with the 144,000. But you see the connection? He's there when it's being rebuilt. Uh, Namedes also commented on Messiah ben Joseph rebuilding the temple. The roles of the four craftsmen are as follows. Elijah heralds in the end of days. If necessary, listen to this. Here's the point. If necessary, they say. Messiah ben Joseph will rage war against the evil forces and die in combat against the enemies of God and Israel. We know this. This was so fascinating. When we revealed this, we proved this out, that Messiah has to do it again, struck twice, you know, uh, 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 Moses and Aaron and so forth. Which, which is why when he comes as Messiah ben Joseph, the high priest and king Melchizedek, he, he's coming through the Ephraim line. He is coming as the ox, as, as the Taurus, as the beginning. Right? He is the beginning and the end. He's coming at the, at the end of 170 that starts the 70 years. He's coming at the end of the other 70 that brings about the completion of it all. He is the beginning and the end. There is a Messiah ben Joseph as Ephraim coming. And he is going to do this again. He is going to be, quote unquote, sacrificed again. But this is for the ox, which is the priestly line who has not yet been sacrificed for. They know it. They always say, if necessary. You'll see this all the time. People say that he will die again, but, you know, maybe kind of. I mean, they'll say some believe it in, in, the, in, the, in the ancient Torah through, the, through some of the rabbis and their interpretations, but we're not really sure. We've proven it. He will. And this Messiah ben Joseph is that picture of what we're talking about here with Josiah again. Here he is right here at the exact timing. In the 18th year, the same prophetic picture in the 18th year, which is Passover, which in the 14 years is the 11th year, which is 10 and a half. At the end of Passover, when the temple's been prepared, we know Satan's cast down. The pit is open and war is going to break out against the two witnesses, against Messiah ben Joseph, the Ephraim and Zerubbabel. And listen to what this says. It's almost like it's almost like he didn't want to fight against them, right? So in the end of days, I mean, does Satan really think he's going to beat the Lord? 
that that seems preposterous. Why would he think he can beat the Lord? But if he can somehow kill him again, he might think Satan might think he's going to be victorious. Right. So listen how this one plays out. It says um, in Second Chronicles thirty five twenty one, as we continue from Josiah going out against him. But he sent ambassadors to him saying, what have I to do with thee? Thou king of Judah, what have I to do with thee? Isn't there something, I don't remember it directly, but something like that, does, does uh, do one of the, the devils, one of the demons say that? Hey, what have I to do with thee, right? My, uh, your time isn't yet, that type of thing. Very similar conversation. He says, I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. For God commanded me to make haste, forbear thee from meddling with God, who is with me, that he destroy thee not. Nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him and hearken not unto the words of Necho from the mouth of God and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo. And the archers shot at King Josiah and the king said to his servants, um, have me away for I am sore wounded. His servants therefore took him out of that chariot and put him in the second chariot. That sounds very interesting. I'll show you why in a moment. That just caught my attention. Took him out of one chariot and put him in a second chariot that he had that brought him, and they brought him to Jerusalem and he died. There's Josiah in the same messianic picture of the end of days and when he would die which would be related to the end of the two and a half year war like the two witnesses the same typology and it said he was buried in the sepulcher of his fathers and judah and jerusalem mourned for josiah now listen to this verse 26 now the rest of the acts of josiah and his goodness according to that which is written in the law of the lord the final verse and his deeds, listen to this, first and last. Hello. First and last, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. First and last, look at that. The last, latter end. First, right? Beginning of time old, from the beginning to the end, directly describing the portion of time of Josiah from the beginning to the end, directly related to the revelation of the end of days, where it does begin at the feast, the true feast of weeks, right before he will make himself known, as we know, to the remnant serving bride for which he says to wait when he returns to the wedding to knock and then what's left when it loops around again so this represents what the end of the 70 from when they came into the land okay this relates to the end of this 70 right here and he's going to come let them know when he returns from the wedding and knocks verse 21 is to the end of the other 70 when they will be resurrected and granted to sit with him in his throne and rule and reign, which would be what? After this 70. So watch what happens. He dies. He's the first and the last. We saw where it was in Second Chronicles chapter 35 directly related to all these things for which we know that if we go back to revelation 11 when the two witnesses are killed the second woe is passed which is the end of the sixth year of trumpets and the end of the 13th year of tribulation what then happens as soon as the seventh trumpet begins to sound the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. When is this? 
this is when he is going to be seen as lightning coming from one end unto the other. Matthew 24, 27, when he is seen as lightning from one end to the other at his coming, which is only found four times in the Gospels, and it's all four are in Matthew 24, and it's what? Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, this 70 comes to an end. He was, as one of the two witnesses, he performed the again, as we know he has to do, to represent the ox for the priestly line. And then what does he do? He's returning as lightning from one end unto the other to be that final year as it was in the days of Noah, which will go from Feast of Trumpets to Feast of Trumpets. And then at the end of that 14th year Feast of Trumpets, there's 10 more days to atonement, which, as we all know, we've talked about it so many times, 10 days later is the Jubilee. And it just so happens that that Jubilee is directly in line all the way back to when Christ declared it in, um, in Luke chapter 4. It's all in order, guys. So what do we see? The end of 70 and this, the end of this 70 being directly correlated to the end of the 13th year, which the end of the 13th year leaves the Lord coming on the day and hour no one knows when he comes as lightning from one end unto the other immediately after the tribulation of those days, which is the end of the sixth year of trumpet judgments he's talking about. And he's coming on the day and hour no one knows is the time of his coming, which is Feast of Trumpets at the end of 13 years to begin that 14th year. And what did it say? Let's go. Let's tie this all up. Bring it back to Revelation chapter 11 again. At the seventh trumpet, when he says the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So what do we know this is? We know that this is going to happen at the end of this 70 now. And so knowing that it's at the end of that 70, if we go from Second Chronicles chapter 35, and we see that this is where he had died after this battle in this picture of the 18th year, mid-trumpets and the two-and-a-half-year war that breaks out, and now he's died as the first and as the last. We go to chapter 36, and what do we see in chapter 36? But the story of King Nebuchadnezzar, that with these things that we've talked about many times in relation to the first 70 coming to an end, what do we see? Verse 21 of 2 Chronicles 36, 21. Of 2 Chronicles 36. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths for as long as she lay desolate, she kept, her, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Do you see how interesting that is and how that played out? Do you realize the entire storyline was a picture of this beginning, the picture of him here during trumpets and him dying to bring about the end of 70. And when 70 came along, the very next chapter after the death of the Lord is the story of the end of 70 years. Do you see how wild that is? Because he's what? He's the beginning and he's the end. He's the beginning and the end. Just like scripture said. How does this beginning start? Taurus. It begins in Taurus. Which is the beginning. And this is the beginning for him. And there is... The end. At the end. Both relating to a 70. This is craziness. You know, we did that video not long ago with the two 70s. Do you know this, guys? If you really want to get pumped up, again, I'm not saying, I cannot say, thus saith the Lord. I've never received one. 
But if you want to understand and get really pumped up about this, understanding these two 70s as we have, and now this bringing even more to the picture, do you know that if we had to go one more year and it went 2024 to 2025 and we were waiting 50 days before the Feast of Trumpets in 2025, that would mean the 70 would have to be up here. Well, you can't. This is the end of the story for Leviticus 19. When you understand the counts that we've shared with you before. Came into the land in 48, planted in 49. They're the house of Judah, so, so uh, a session compared to non-accession. And then you count those five years, and then you've got your 70. That's the end of the line. But even more exciting to really be able to solidify it is knowing that there's a 70 in another typology that ends the 13 years. Oh, you're not sure about that one? Let's go to Jeremiah chapter 25 and let's see what happens. Jeremiah chapter 25, where we've shared many times, verse 11, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years, and it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldees will I make uh, uh, and will make it perpetual desolations. When what? When 70 years are accomplished. Oh, but that could be the first 70. Who says it's the second 70? Well, all we have to do is find out what the Lord's going to do at that end of 70. He's going to have all nations to drink of the wine of the wrath of Almighty God. And what do they do? They're going to have to drink and be drunken. And what does he say when we get to verse 30 of Jeremiah 25? Therefore prophesy against them all these words and say unto them, The Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He shall mightily roar from his habitat upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. When he's coming to what? When he's coming to tread the grapes at the end of 70 years. That's when he returns feet down immediately after the 70 years, immediately after is, is, is again that takes place. When he will then return feet down on the Mount of Olives. When he does, he's coming with what? That second sword dipped with blood. To tread the wine grapes, the wine press of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. All of it is there, guys. The whole storyline is right there for us. It, it's this 70 to 70. So if one more year was some strange count that's not biblical, that made us go one more year, then guess what we would have? We would only have 12 years. We would only have 12 years in what Scripture told us was 14 and the 15th being the Jubilee, which in the big picture is 21 and 22, just like the Hebrew alphabet. Do you understand that between the end of 170 and the end of the other is 13 years? And the scriptures tell us when the Lord returns feet down at the seventh year of trumpets, Matthew 24, when he comes as lightning from one end unto the other, it's going to be the days of Noah, that final year, plus 10 days, because then the 10 days relate to the Jubilee. Exactly 13 years between them. What? One more year would only be 12. You understand, there is no funky count to try to understand this one. This is the one from when you come into the land. This one is from when they captured the other portion of Jerusalem. There are two pictures of 70 coming to an end. And this one that we have known as the beginning is now 
through the story of Josiah, also showing us that it is an end of 70, and that Messiah, an anointed one, who is Cyrus as an anointed one, in an end of 70, is a prophetic picture of Christ, when all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me. Man, I thought that was so wild. Guys, it's, it, how many things have we revealed in this, right? How many times have we been able to go into all of these different things and, and show over and over and over and over again the connections to the revelation of the end of days and how they're connected to Yeshua? It's, it's, it's incredible. It's absolutely incredible. Let me play this last little bit, and then we will call it a night. Judge, we're going to be so so. He set up on a on a campaign of revival, and the campaign of revival is he went through. First, he went to Jerusalem because because it was even you know the altars were even there in Jerusalem, which which would translate to even in the churches today. You know, you have apostasy, you have you have dilution of the word, you have all these things. You wonder why where why things are going the way they're going. But he turned it around. This one man sold out for God. He literally, it says his heart was totally for God like nobody. You know? and, and what it's saying is one man. Now, now here's the other thing about this Josiah moment. Because th- we are in the Josiah moment right now. And the thing is, what it's saying is, you know, Josiah came at the end. It, it wasn't to, it was in the time of judgment. It was going to be judged. The kingdom was going to be destroyed. Okay, but. And what do we know? So we see this at the end, at the end of now, and at the end of the end of tribulation, that final portion of the age. So what else do we know about Josiah? We saw at the beginning that he was an overturner of tables, right? A, a destroyer of these, of, these, of these altars that they had created. Well, watch how this plays out. If we go to Matthew chapter 21, watch this. Because again, this story in its order is so important look at what it says so in in matthew 21 verse 12 it says and jesus went into the temple of god and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves so what are we seeing a picture of we're seeing this this picture of christ upon his return overturning everything that was taking place in the temple remember he's there right we've got him there from the seventh year of seals during the first three and a half years with the rebuilding of the city streets and temple satan is cast down the pit is open the beast comes back they've got two and a half years and at the end of those two and a half years josiah messiah right the again happens as as the as the uh, uh, Messiah ben Joseph and so forth. And then what happens? When this final portion is over, Matthew's discourse says immediately after the tribulation of those days. So immediately after, remember, they were lying in the streets for three and a half days. And then they resurrect, right? And what happens? The Lord immediately after that is the seventh year of the the seventh trumpet starting in the seventh year. As soon as that seventh trumpet begins to sound, which will be at the day and hour no one knows that the Feast of Trumpets starts that seventh year. And, And what do we know happens? He's coming as lightning from one end to the other. He's coming on the clouds of heaven. And it'll be that one year is Noah. Well, watch this. See what happens here? Remember how we, we've shared on this in the past. You guys will remember this. I won't go into every one of them. But in Matthew chapter 21, we've showed it from Mark. See? The triumphal entry. You guys remember this? Luke, Mark, Matthew. I showed you guys in the beginning, even on the website, when you go to the video to see how pre, mid, and post are revealed in the triumphal entry, the resurrection, and the... Um, Mount Transfiguration, all of the ones in Luke are giving you a prophetic picture of the pre-trib. 
and the coming of the Lord for 40 days. In Mark, they're giving you a picture of the end of the sixth year of seals that the Lord's coming on heavenly Mount Zion. At the end, in Matthew, they're all giving you a picture of the Lord's coming at the end of 13 years to start that 14th year when he comes on, on the clouds of heaven as lightning from one end to the other for the whole world to see. Okay? So we know, and we've known and taught on this for a long time, that this is a typology of the Lord returning at the day and hour no one knows in Matthew chapter 24 to start the 14th year. And when we follow the storyline, as we've done with Luke, Mark, and Matthews, remember, let me give you one example. This is always a, a really good one. In Luke's, the triumphal entry is in chapter 19, and watch what happens. <laughs> in fact, we know the story. We've showed it from the parable, right, uh, of the ten minas. Then you've got the triumphal entry. <clears throat> so if Luke's represents a pre-picture, it's not the pre-trib, it's a picture of him coming after the wedding to begin the 40 days, okay? He sent two of his disciples. Yep, that's right, the Luke guys, right? Look what happens when he comes at his triumphal entry in Luke. This is the beginning of his 40 days, okay? We see right here. Who are the stones that will immediately cry out? We know that's the remnant workers. They are the stones, right? The little stones as he is the stone, the rock. But only Luke's has this that follows the story of the triumphal entry. When he weeps over Jerusalem because they did not know this their day that they're now going to be compassed about by their enemies, uh, uh, trenched about, and they're going to be destroyed because they knew not the time of their visitation. He is warning. This is him coming to warn for 40 days, as he said he would in Luke chapter 11, as he said, as Jonah did. When we go to Mark, we see the same thing, but you don't see him weeping over Jerusalem when you follow the story of what comes next. You see the different story of the fig tree and the figs not being ready and so forth. In Matthew, it's kind of like the, it's, it's similar but different in relation to the, the mustard seed story. Because the one in the mustard seed and the thing surrounding the mustard seed, it was this storyline of this pre and the 40 days events, then all of seals, then trumpets for Mark and Matthews. But in this one, it's not necessarily all those events. It's the stuff at his coming. In relation to the start of 40, the start of the seventh year of seals, and the start of the seventh year of trumpets. And it's the immediate story that follows it that gives us more insight to what he's doing when he comes. So when we come to Matthews, and we follow that same trajectory of understanding, look at what comes first in Matthews following the prophetic typology of him coming at the end of the six, at the end of the six years of trumpet judgments, which is the start of the 14th year, look at when he comes. He's cleansing the temple. What was, what was the picture of Josiah? When he goes in, flips the tables or, or destroys the altars? This is exactly what we have in the same prophetic timing when the Lord returns feet down and goes to the temple and casts them all out and will gather them because it's the end of 70, will then gather them to the battle of the treading of the grapes. Now watch this. This is the picture of the Lord coming at the triumphal entry. So you guys will remember, if you've been around for a while, only in Matthew's gospel, in the differences in the gospels, only Matthew's tells us that there was an ass tied and a colt, comma and, meaning they were two separate. In Mark's there was one, and in Luke's, there was one. This is the picture of the Lord coming at the seventh trumpet, at the start of the 14th year, at the day and hour no one knows, like Matthew's gospel, his discourse tells us, when he's coming as lightning from one end unto the other. He's coming with the ass tied and the colt, and to prove it out, knowing that he is as a Josiah, when he's coming to destroy that altar, the things that they have done in it, and to overturn the money changers, what do we know he's going to do at this point? Well, what we just said. It'll be the end of 70. So if it's the end of 70, what does he have to do? 
he's going to have to then gather them as when he comes with the ass and the colt and gather them to bring destruction against all those who came against Jerusalem in the treading of the grapes. So watch what happens. Watch what happens. We go back, you guys will remember this, in Genesis chapter 49, when we talked about Joseph, you see, when we talked about Joseph, that's this, the, this mid portion, right? Uh, by a well whose branches ran over the wall, right? The archers have sorely grieved him. And listen to this. <laughs> Genesis 49, 23. This is Joseph as, remember, Messiah ben Joseph when he comes. He's a fruitful bow. It relates to the 144 because he is the high priest and king. And we know that he's going to battle like Josiah did, right? And look at what it says about Joseph in 49.23. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him. We didn't know that before, did we? And shot at him. You see? Why would they shoot at him? Because we know he's going to battle. We know he's going to battle in those final two and a half years, and he will die. But it's purposed. It's for the priestly line of all of history to make an atonement for them. He is shot at. Hello? Didn't we just read that exact same thing about Josiah? The archers shot at him, and then he ended up dying? Well, now watch what happens. That brings us to the end of the sixth year. But when he returns, feet down on the Mount of Olives, who's he coming as? He's coming as the, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. Remember we showed that, that picture, that chart, right? The, I had that rectangle. It shows from Messiah, right, as Messiah, uh, um, uh, uh, ben, like Messiah David, right? Um, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. On the east, then he comes for 40 days. Then he comes as the, as the, uh, uh, um, as the ox, as Messiah ben Joseph. You have the eagle of mid-trumpets at the cutoff. And then the final two and a half years, he's killed, and it wraps around to the east side again. And on the east side, let me show you that picture. And on the east side, what ends up happening? It wraps right around again, right? This one here. There's the escape of the bride connected to the east. Then he returns as man, as the son of man for 40 days. Then he's coming at the end of the sixth year of seals as the ox, as Messiah ben Joseph Ephraim, until the cutoff as the north with the eagle, and they fly away on the wings of an eagle into the wilderness at mid-trumpets. Then you've got the battle that takes place for two and a half years until he's killed in the again that takes place, as we just saw with the arrow and so forth. And then he returns feet down on the Mount of Olives as the lion of the tribe of Judah. So now that this happened with Joseph, we now come and see what we just saw connected to Matthew chapter 21 when he comes at the triumphal entry, which is when he comes at the 14th year, which is the end of 70, when everything in heaven and on earth is given to him, and he's going to gather them to the treading of the grapes, right? So look what happens for Judah. In Genesis 49, 8, Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise, thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies, uh, thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Judah is a lion's whelp from the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stood, uh, he stooped down, he crouched down as a lion, and as an old lion, who shall arise him up? Verse 10, 10 and 11, here it comes. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Listen to this. Binding his foul 
unto the vine, comma, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine. Two of them, brothers and sisters. The differences in the Gospels. Luke only has one. Mark only has one. Matthew has two. And the triumphal entries are the 40 days of the Son of Man pre-trib, are the end of seals to be at the seventh year of seals to start it in Mark's triumphal entry. And in Matthew's triumphal entry is a picture of the Lord when he returns feet down to begin that final year when he's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah with the fowl and the ass, two of them. And what does it say about him? He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of of grapes why because when the 70 years are over as jeremiah 25 just showed us when 70 years are over he will gather them to the treading of the grapes of wrath and in revelation 19 13 it tells us and he was clothed with a vestiture dipped in blood who's coming with a vestiture dipped in blood related to his triumphal entry at the 14th year when 70 years have come to an end. You get it? At the treading of the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. All of it is in order, and it must begin with a 70 coming to an end and a 70 coming to an end. One to begin, one to end. The, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Josiah is another incredible picture for us, brothers and sisters, of the revelation of the appointed times of the coming of the Lord. And we just now got to witness this, this circle, if you will, almost like the picture. We just got to witness this wrapping around of how 70 starts it and 70 ends it, and the picture of it was something that we've taught on in many times, but never as it being a beginning. Uh, sorry, always as it being a beginning, never as an end. And literally, literally, this incredible Passover, at the time it should be, and the temple prepared as it would be, to Josiah, who is the Messiah type, going out to fight and dying with what? An arrow from the archers that shot King Josiah, for which in the very last verse of 35, he dies as the first and the last. And chapter 36 is all about the 70 years typology. In the end being the 70 count of Jerusalem, when now it says he will bring judgment against them. Crazy. Another revelation for another perfect prophetic typology of Josiah as the Messiah. And what was he telling us the whole time? What was, when you watch the video and you go and see what he's talking about this whole time, you see that Josiah's connection is to Laodicea. And we are in this Laodicean age. And what have we known about Laodicea? As I started it, so will I end it. It starts with the group who is prepared, who will be told to be ready when he returns from the wedding, that when he knocks, they will open to him and he will sup with them and serve them and eat with them. That when Laodicea then comes to an end, this group that did this will take their thrones with Messiah to rule and reign with them, having their part in the first resurrection because they put their necks on the line for him. He is the start of Laodicea. He is the end of Laodicea. The literal end of days will actually begin. The world won't know it at that moment, but the remnant workers will. And as I said, I don't know if it's going to be days before. I doubt it. 
I don't know if it's going to be hours or just moments before. It would be awesome if we got maybe an hour or two just to go and declare it everywhere, right? It, it would be crazy. But I don't know how long it will be. But Scripture has told us that he will declare it to this group first, to this remnant, Smyrna, Luke 24, remnant workers, the, the remnant winter wheat lay a bride portion remaining who will be the cover crop, brothers and sisters. They are the Lord's cover crop who upon their death will bring much more fruit. God is good and the Spirit is always leading. I am so grateful. I'm grateful for the Lord having chosen us to, to bring about his revelation. I'm grateful for all of you guys and over each other for the prayers that we all do for each other, for the support that comes in for all of us and for each other all over the world. I am so grateful. I am so thankful for all of it. I would not change a single thing. I am so grateful for him and all that he has blessed us with in understanding, in, in testing, and everything that I've gone through in my story. As you guys know, I would not change a thing, and I wouldn't change a single one of you either. I only pray that we will bring many, many, many more even before the tribulation begins and get many more prepared. And when the time comes, man, oh, man, what? a trip this is going to be <laughs> brothers and sisters i love you god bless you god bless your families we'll talk to you soon bye for now